Can you uh, see the uh, types of deep learning network uh, presentation? Yes. Okay. Let's, uh, we've done uh, indirectly a lot of this material already, so let's get started. Um, we've seen this picture probably several times. I, I like this. This one is a good picture, and the, the seven networks mentioned are probably good choice for the top seven networks to look at. And um, you probably will th at least think about doing the first six. And if you really get into sophisticated applications, you'll move on to seven. And then we have I, this uh, slightly more um, ambitious category of 27 types, but uh, I think that's just for fun. I don't think we need to look at all of those. Um, so here is a, a few links. I mean, as I've mentioned many times, there's so much data, um, so many articles on the web, it's sort of um, difficult to keep up. Um, and at least on this service medium.com, when I, when I read articles about a certain subject, they then deluge me with another 20 articles on that subject in the following weeks. And um, this basically just is the um, index to the, this particular talk. And so we'll just move on from here and because we'll go through these one by one in the slides. We've seen this picture many times and you've already used it in the, in the homework. And it's still a pretty important network. I mean, like there is, a, we discussed network, there's some really nice examples of networks that say map the uh, definition of a compound in, in terms of a chemical compound into its properties. That's typically done with this type of network. So sort of a database, lookup method, and that has proven to be very powerful at predicting material properties for new materials and also for predicting drugs. And indeed it's meant to have significantly improved the prediction of new drugs, the, the identification of new drugs where you use your network to reduce the number that could be possibly useful compounds and then you do your classical pharmaceutical tests on them for, um, for real, in real, for real examples. Um, and then we've already effectively done this type of uh, MLP. All of the examples here are just taken from advanced deep learning for, with Keras and converted to, um, um, converted to Python notebooks or Colab notebooks. So convolutional neural nets are the, um, they, they effectively are the, the deep learning implementation of image processing. And they, affect, they build in the concept of locality that uh, if you have an image, pixels near each other are going to have relationships. And that was built into image processing from the beginning. You look for edges and I mean, you, you identify objects in an image by finding the edges and the edges are then the differences, uh, diff uh, um, drastic change in the structure of the pixels is, is the definition of an edge. And so the convolutions are um, effectively filters that uh, identify edges and things like that. Except that Don, it was sort of interesting. I, I never realized this, but I must admit a few years ago when I first started I'm trying to understand this. In image processing, you feed in the filters that identify edges as really simple different, differentiation filters. In um, deep learning, you make no assumptions like that. You feed in the filter as a filter with arbitrary structure. You only choose the size of the filter, how many pixels it link, looks at, and then it finds the right structure which uh, does the correct, uh, the optimal, let's say it's not correct, the optimal um, choice of uh, filter coefficients. And that's sort of pretty interesting that, that I don't think 
It never occurred to me that that could be possible um, a few years ago, at least. And um, there are obviously other examples of convolutional neural nets for problems where locality is important. And um, for example, in the case of earthquakes where we studied, we looked at convolutional neural nets for earthquakes because earthquakes have a locality. If you have an earthquake at a particular point, you're more likely to have earthquakes near it. However, for that problem, it, they didn't add much value. So, because that particular locality was obviously sort of different. So, a lot of this is, of course, experimental. Here is the, the collab, which looks at uh, that. I will set our homework, which tells you to look at these different collabs. Um, the next one shouldn't be here. It should have been in the previous um, discussion last week of components. I should have moved it. I realized, I told you last week it should have been moved, but I never moved it. Uh, but dropout is actually, dropout and stochastic gradient descents are sort of small miracles or brilliant ideas because they use statistics in a way that's slightly unusual in my opinion and different from the way they got used in the past. Previously, we used statistics to change variables randomly to explore things, but dropout is um, stochastic gradient descent has this deep idea of statistically sampling the data set. And dropout has this uh, deep idea of statistically sampling the model. I had never seen such an idea in previous models before deep learning. Um, and um, here we have um, an example on the right where the, uh, uh, at, you have at the top a classic multi-layer perceptron and then dropout will just um, randomly remove no nodes. And you, that is, you just, that is implemented in all these standard packages and you just choose the fraction of nodes that need to be uh, dropped. And it has lots of interesting features. The, the uh, is usually sold on being um, useful for um, stopping overfitting because by removing part of the model, you're not training the exact model to fit the exact data. You're feeding approximate models to fit the exact data, which hopefully means the model will do better on different data. So it will do better on the testing set or the validation set. Um, but it's also being, it's also used, and I use it like this, to estimate errors, because you can think of it as um, randomly choosing a model. So you actually, are, when you do a training with dropout, you not, you look at many models, which are actually chosen, chosen statistically. And by using the variation due to dropout, you can actually estimate the error in the estimate of the resultant uh, <coughs> prediction. And this is actually one of the few ways of estimating errors in a realistic fashion. The other ways of finding errors involve doing a rather complex Bayesian model, which is pretty difficult to do with lots of um, lots of variables. So dropout, when dropout is automatically built into um, all these uh, frameworks, PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet, and so on. And, um, but you still have to decide where you use it because it's not quite so obvious when you use it and when you don't use it. And, whether the dropout is 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.4, all of those you can see in, in standard examples. And I've just given you a few of the many articles on dropout. This is even more a technical issue, max pooling. And uh, <clears throat> it is just basically a way of accumulating information by pooling them together. And um, you always try to look at things at different resolutions and different ways, and then you add them together with the pooling layer. As far as I know, that's mainly used in images. It came from the image 
the people who built these incredibly brilliant uh, image processing uh, neural nets. Well, recurrent neural nets are also is actually a small miracle because they actually are so successful. And whereas you can sort of understand maybe what a multi-layer perceptron is, we know why they're, it's sort of a model of neurons all connected to each other and feeding back and forth. So that sounds reasonable. We know what convolutional networks is. There's an intuitive reason for that because you're looking for locality and changes uh, which are local. But recurrent neural nets are aimed to process sequences and uh, Sequences are incredibly important. Um, we've mentioned, probably mentioned that already. I mean, the, for commercially, where of course most of this work gets done, those sequences are typically uh, audio signals, video signals, uh, text. Uh, te the text on a page is a sequence because the, the, letter, the letters and words and sentences follow each other. And um, so recurrent neural nets are actually pretty old. It's sort of interesting that some of these brilliant ideas in deep learning were developed long before deep learning was successful. And yet they then, so then when they suddenly realized that it was gonna work, they came back to these older methods which had been derived and, uh, and then applied them. And the recur recurrent neural net is corresponds to uh, an input model, which is a sequence, such as in a sentence, you might feed the sentence in, or uh, possibly a smaller grouping of uh, characters. In the case of um, when I use it to analyze COVID data, that uh, the sequence is the daily data which you um, use to uh, you record on the COVID infections or COVID fatalities, and you feed that in, and then you're trying to learn from the time structure. So in the case of COVID, the sequence is a sequence in time. In the case of natural language, the sequence is the sequence of, uh, of characters in a speech. And the recurrent neural net is something, whereas a a convolutional neck starts with a flat thing, an image, which then moves through the um, thing with every with all the pixels at the same level. A recurrent neural net is a arrow which goes through the uh, network um, with each each uh, each member of that uh, sequence being processed one after another. And when you use them, a, a pretty important choice is how long the sequence is. Um, it's probably more natural for language because sentences and things give you a natural length. For COVID, it's uh, not so obvious what the length should be. And for some other examples like earthquakes, even less clear. Um, so here is the correspond the, the uh, advanced deep learning and care as uh, example for an, an, a recurrent neural net. And by the way, before we get on to the, we should note we you never use recurrent neural nets because there are two, two more sophisticated uh, uh, extensions of RNNs which work better, which are called GRUs and LSTMs. And here is the one I always use, the LSTM. Um, and it says it was invented in the 1990s. So that was a brilliant invention. Um, and it's pretty complicated. Here we have, here we have somehow the key, key ideas of the, um, of the, you have the, the result being, being uh, produced, the Cs. You have the inputs, which are the Xs, which just feed in as a sequence here. You have a history which you are merging with the X's. So the idea is that these recurrent nets, in the case of a image, you have all these pixels and you have one pixel interacting with another pixel with the, with the filter. In the case of a, of a uh, sequence, you want to interact not in space, uh, but in time. And so that's, uh, well, you actually, and there's a, uh, 
In the case of LSTMs, you can interact in both space and time with something called a convolutional LSTM. But um, typically, you um, and most important is the interaction in time because the time dependence is what you're trying to predict. Like for earthquakes, you want to know will there be an earthquake later in time? In the case of COVID, you want to know um, what, how many, what the infections will be like in a in a few days or weeks' time. Here is a corresponding Keras example. And here is an example of another student in, um, in the Intelligent Systems Engineering, JCS, uh, produced for uh, learning about the, um, uh, trying to learn the motion of particles. I think I mentioned that example earlier. And here you have on the, on the right, you have the actual current neural net. This thing over here is just a picture of the LSTM with I, I should say, I, I haven't gone through the details of the LSTM because I don't really have a true good intuition for why you have these particular gates. Each of these gates, you have one of these activation functions. And so LSTMs have a very extensive use of activation functions. Um, and key uh, when you use these LSTMs there are two things you can three things you can choose uh, one is the number of, of uh, the spatial size of the LSTM how many inputs it has um, because that's not necessarily the same as the number of inputs of your original data because you may have actually usually start on an LSTM off with a, a, a fully connected network which maps from a certain number of input parameters to a different number of parameters that go through the uh, spatial parameters, which go through the uh, LSTM. And it depends on the complexity of the problem, how many of those are. So this thing here is, um, is fed in this way. If at one time, if we have X is here, we have the X1 here, X2 here, X3, and so on, up to the final value. Um, and so this is the thing going through in a sequence and they produce answers, which are then um, sent to another layer. So you have, you have to choose this number here, which is five, uh, well, it's as drawn as five. And uh, you have to choose the number of input lengths, which is 96 in this case. And you then have to choose the number of layers. You, and typically, you use two layers. Um, so this also points out another. I told you we have here a, a fully connected network to input the data and convert from the input data size to the uh, int internal LSTM uh, size. And here we have we go from the internal LSTM to the final output. That's again a fully connected network. So it's it's actually quite easy to write down with uh, these these Keras or TensorFlow or PyTorch, but uh, it's pretty sophisticated. And all this was, I say, invented 30 years ago, or well, 25 years ago. That's sort of pretty interesting. Now GIUs are shown here on the bottom. Here we have RNNs, which is just have one simple activation function. And that basically didn't, was found effectively not to work. As far as I know, GIUs and LSTMs uh, both work. And they are very similar, except the GIU has three, not four um, uh, inputs, uh, activations. And, um, I do not, I have not used GIUs as much. And I, when I did, I think LSTM somewhat outperformed it. So I've just settled on LSTM. Um, probably GIUs, well, I'm sure they have less parameters. So there may be some reason if your data is limited, you will use a GIU. But uh, maybe you can find this, but I've not seen an article with a clear description of when you use GIUs and when you use LSTMs.
Autoencoders are again a brilliant idea um, where you have, um, this is uh, this is when you're trying to, often you want to form reduced dimension representations. You have a high dimensional state, like uh, one example where these are used is actually in, in um, trying to control uh, molecular dynamic simulation. So supposing you're running a molecular dynamic simulation with thousands or hundreds of thousands of particles in it, uh, you, want, you, you want to run those particles, you want to do that total simulation and you want to uh, track it and try to make it not get lost in, in, in the middle of the simulation. You do that, this, is, uh, this was done before deep learning by trying to find so-called collective coordinates, some coordinates which you can reproduce the essence of the system and transport it through uh, the, the simulation faster. And this is, a, and that's effectively what you're doing here. You're coming up here, which in this case here is the, uh, for its position of velocity in three dimensions. So this is six times the number of particles. And here we have some internal um, representation of the, um, of that input data, which is more compact. It's called, it's sometimes it's called dimension reduction and where you're trying to map things in one, in a high dimension to something in a low dimension. And you, you do this by this clever idea of actually training it to reproduce itself, but forcing it to pass through this um, low dimension layer in the middle. So that's a pretty interesting idea, which is can be built into several types of um, neural nets of actually trying to uh, trying to change the size of the system you're looking at to hopefully increase the learning path. And you, this clever idea here is you, do, you don't actually need any training data because that's why it's unsupervised learning because you're training it with itself. You just need data because this, this intermediate layer is learning to represent the data itself. And there is a variant of this, which is often used in some cases where there are uh, some sort of uh, special feature of the data, which makes some sort of variational principles important. And um, it is uh, got a different loss function from the traditional autoencoders. We applied actually a variational autoencoder to a case which we thought it should work because it was trying to look at the spatial distribution of, uh, of, of gene sequences, but actually the ordinary autoencoder gave slightly better answers. Um, still, it's, a, it's a obviously an important type. And if you look at autoencoders, you should also look at variational autoencoders. Here it is again from the Keras uh, book, uh, an autoencoder to create a classifier. Now it's applicable to MNIST because if you have all this data, you have a lot of data, it makes some sense to try to, re to reduce that data to a lower dimension, which captures the essence of the data and then use that to do the mappings with. Here is one that's um, even more possibly obscure. But I think it's actually less obscure. The transformers are a natural architecture. They're actually more natural in some sense than LSTMs. Because when transformers, you're looking at sequences again, which are not, you're not actually uh, running the sequence in time. You take the sequence and flatten it in space. So you, you, you have as your input in one, in one plane, all the sequence data just lined up. So this particular network looks at all the data at once, all the sequences, and what it's trying to do is to find the so-called context or attention, which is the relationship between the other, any magic, or not magic, any significant um, uh, patterns which are in place between the different, the different input sequences and the, Usual example is um, 
I don't know, let's take, uh, usually people use Taylor Swift. Let's take Charles Dickens. Charles and Dickens are somehow correlated. If you have a Dickens, you're more likely to see a Charles. So that's an example of a, uh, of a correlation that transformer networks were meant to discover. And they do discover such correlations. And, um, and they, oh, they were largely developed, I think are still their dominant use is in uh, is in the natural language processing area, so either speech or voice recognition and text uh, text uh, text processing, and um, it is um, it was done by a brilliant paper by Google in 2017, and it is it may not and I think various reinforced. It's more sophisticated algorithms yet and at the best, but it is very near the best approach to such problems. Um, here is a bit of mathematics to show what it actually does. I told you this interesting feature that in convolutional nets you have filters and the, the, um, um, the network learns the filters. Well, actually the... Uh, <coughs> This idea of attention is pretty simple. Uh, you form a, you, 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 you first take the data, all the data and you map it. You take, I'm, I'm, I told you in the case of these sequences, you lay them out, but you take each sequence and map it into some, you hash it effectively into some encoding, then um, which has, which is encoded, which is replicated in time. So you get, you, then what you have to do, what you do is you take each, sequence and compare it with every other sequence. And for each sequence, you learn a query vector called Q, which is just a, a um, vector which is for, which is learned. You, it learns how to form this vector Q. So you take your um, input data, you multiply it by a matrix or two, or put it through an activation layer, and you get a vector Q. Then you get a vector that's used to query. <coughs> then you look at vectors K, which are the keys. So the keys are what you're trying to find. And so again, you learn the keys. You do not feed any of these in. And um, then you take the Q and the K and you multiply them together. And then you um, find the, uh, the best match between the Qs and the Q of one sequence and the K of all other sequences. Take each Q with all Ks. Then you find the Q, the Q, K um, scalar product, which is got the maximum value, which you create by running it through a softmax thing, which uh, I told you is how you create uh, effectively single classifications. And then when you have that, do so we decided which K is the best, you then associate a V to it. So this Q generates a V. The V is the value. And so these Vs are what the, uh, the, uh, are the way the, uh, uh, this uh, neural net is tries to characterize these sequences. And you run it through multiple attention gathering steps to get several Vs. And you use those Vs to make, uh, to, to decide what this sequence means and to look for patterns. So, and those patterns are because they're, there's, there are clear patterns. Uh, we know that the, in the English, I mean, any language, when you write it out, there are lots of patterns. And if you can learn all those patterns, then you can, uh, then you can, you can use those patterns, which you've learned to map the, see, the sentence into its meaning. If you want to know, um, this is actually a very, um, this idea of using patterns to identify the future or the meaning is very common. People have been using it, still use it continuously. I come back to the, one of the problems I've looked at for many years, at trying to foretell earthquakes. There are lots of uh, literature which effectively try to look at patterns such as water oozing out of uh, rocks or dogs barking, which are meant to foretell earthquakes. 
So that's an, dogs barking is an example of a pattern. Well, we can't feed the dogs barking into a neural net. So the pattern which the neural net recognizes is some pattern of shocks or, or some measurement of earth movement or something like that, um, GPS measurements, which tell you how much the earth has moved. There's also actually, if you follow the stock market, um, there is a rather, in my opinion, not so reputable way of trying to predict the stock market called technical analysis. And it looks at the, pattern, the structure of the price of a stock, such as head and shoulders, and, uh, which I think is uh, presumably is a sort of three, three headed pattern. And they use that type of structure to forecast whether that stock will go up and down. So that's a sort of um, uh, uh, an interesting example of where patterns are actually very well established. So, anyway, the, 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 the transformer is trying to look for patterns and you can look for the patterns in all sorts of places. And at least when I tried it, it's, um, it was quite um, successful, but um, it, it, it was, there are a lot of places to look. Actually, because these things are all giant matrices, they run real fast on GPUs. And so actually the transformer is, although it looks more complicated than other methods, actually runs quite fast, at least when I used it, it did. Um, here is an example of, here we have our, our sequences. We have uh, the sequences are of time length five, and I've drawn you 10 of them. And so we're, here we imagine our transformer looking at uh, 10 um, sequences. Then we can do also, we can think of anything. We can, we can look on time for patterns. We can look in space for patterns. And um, we can also look over everything, space and time. Um, so that's, uh, and that's a choice you, I think as far as I can see, that's a choice you can make. The transformer, because it came from uh, the natural languaging example, I don't, like, application, I don't quite see how to apply what they did for natural languages to choose the natural <coughs> uh, time of attention to apply that to other areas. Like for earthquakes, it's not at all obvious whether it's the structure of the, at the time at the time period of seconds, which are, are, which predicts the future or the time scale of years, it can be uh, non-trivial. All right, here is uh, here's one you'll find more fun. GANs are very famous. Uh, the generative adversarial networks were uh, brilliantly invented by one of the pioneers, good fellow of uh, of uh, deep learning and it's trying to generate fake fake data and it has these uh, two networks um, which are essentially debate with each other as to whether something is fake or real and by and you it can actually generate random random so it has real images and random images and it learns to discriminate between them but then you take a random image and produce a real image out of it. And uh, that gives you these remarkable pictures. And they're famous as for producing fake pictures. Here is an example of medium.com. I started reading about GANs and they told me, they gave me all these articles to read over a few weeks. So I list them for you. And finally, there is reinforcement uh, learning, which is um, trying to teach, uh, teach the network to, uh, to um, identify the, uh, the right answer and make policy decisions. And um, I, I have a very good student looking at this at the moment, and he is finding it relatively hard to actually generate uh, reliable, good results. So I think reinforcement learning is uh, has been shown to be by the heroes of the field like Google who have infinite compute time. 
uh, to be to work, but um, and the idea is that you feed in, uh, so you <coughs> you give uh, you have an agent, and, you, and then you reward that agent when it makes the right decision, and you uh, dis disreward it when it makes the wrong decision, and uh, I think the the way these um, people play games like Go is by using this type of reinforcement learning. I believe that you can think of it as being not a different type of network, but a different way of optimizing other approaches. And I've told you this comes from this uh, uh, article, this um, pretty nice book on Keras, even though Keras is now TensorFlow, when it, the book was written, Keras was everything. Now it's just TensorFlow. All right, I went through that pretty fast because I, I want to finish these technical lectures to, today. Do you have any questions? In general, you can, I, there are, I told you there are seven basic networks. If we ignore reinforcement learning, I think those other six, which uh, we mentioned, which we've gone through, you could expect to want to know, know how to use all of those six because they all cover there are, all, there are lots of nice examples where they are, each one of those six is the best approach. Um, so, all right, do we, so, so uh, we'll move on if you have no questions, which to my last of my technical presentations. Let me try to share it. Actually, I shouldn't have, uh, I'm stupid. It's the same sharing, except we just need to change the tab. So I pressed the wrong button. All right. So this is an area which I, I mentioned to you. I've worked in optimization for a long time. And it predates deep learning, of course. And um, but a lot of the key concepts of optimization underlie deep learning. And I think it's pretty useful to understand optimization. All right, so let's get started. <coughs> so we, <coughs> we have to first define the objective function, which is what we optimize. Uh, then we have to, um, which is the actual function we optimize. Then we need to define a model, which is uh, in the case of deep learning, the collection of uh, weights uh, in the neural net. Then we need to define the uh, way we, uh, we explore the objective function with the model, which is called training. In all cases known ever known, we have to worry about local minima or, or optima. Um, I mentioned uh, the old way one used to avoid that, which was annealing, which is still a valid way, but uh, it's not so, it's not, doesn't fit in with deep learning quite as well as some other methods. And then we have lots of examples of optimization. We come back and look at models a bit more deeply with examples of objective functions. I pointed out that um, stochastic gradient descent, which is used by deep learning, is a greedy algorithm. It goes the, it goes the, uh, it, it finds the direction which, which reduces the uh, loss, the objective function by the most it can in the shortest step. A little note on distances, because often it's useful to have distances to be able to, uh, to uh, do the optimization. There is some discussion here of discrete and continuous parameters. 
Shidekha the algorithms are listed here as they're the right way to, and it's one of the better ways to do discrete problems. And then we just have a little slide on heuristics. Okay, that's what it is, that's what's here. <coughs> All right, so we're trying to optimize something, which means we have to have a function e, which we're optimizing. And it can depend on billions of parameters. And given my background as a physicist, I use E because E is energy and nature is always minimizing, uh, possibly not the energy, the free energy. And that also depends on more than billions of parameters. It depends on all the parameters specify the positions of all the particles in the world. Because uh, nature is, uh, I mean, all the, the laws of physics come from uh, variational principles that minimize the Hamiltonian, which is the energy. Now we, there's a little bit of confusion as to whether we're maximizing or minimizing. And you know, you know an optimist would tend to maximize, but normally we multiply that optimist and optimist by a minus sign and do minimization. Um, a particular often used particular nice form of E is one of the sum of squares. And sums of squares are pretty useful because they're bound to be positive. So there's no possibility of the function disappearing to negative infinity. Um, then we have um, these choice of parameters, discrete parameters, which are the so-called hyperparameters in deep learning or the Simon problems, then you're trying to assign a picture to a type of object, a polar bear or a, or a Tesla or something. And um, then we have continuous parameters, which are the deep learning weights themselves, or if we're doing clustering, the cluster centers. And that, when I started optimization, which was uh, you know, whatever it was, um, 55 years ago, then we actually used to discuss, then the things did not have billions of parameters. We had tens or hundreds of parameters. And we used to write, um, build um, optimization methods that uh, were distinguished typically by how much information they used. Did they just use the ability to take a value for the parameters you're trying to optimize and calculate the loss function? Or did you also calculate the first and and typically not the second derivative. And uh, these methods, the steepest descent is, a, is a, a first derivative calculation method. And uh, as is, and, and then there are these various uh, sophisticated uh, refinements on how you do the optimization, expectation, maximization, and stochastic gradient descent. It's worth noticing and this is often used in these old days when we only did a few number of parameters, we often built it around line searches. If you have one parameter, it is pretty easy to optimize a function of one parameter because you start at a point, take another point, and then you go to the middle of that point, those two points calculate the value, then you decide which side of the, which way to narrow in on the minimum. So, one dimension searches are very easy, but of course as deep learning is built around huge numbers of parameters, the, the history behind one dimensional searches is not so useful. Uh, in the, when you come to hundreds of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of variables, you can use Newton's method, which um, I know from my daughter who's 15, who's doing um, just learn, do, it's just done Newton's method earlier this year. And uh, so presumably it's a very well-known method. And um, it uses the second derivative um, to find the, uh, to, to find uh, not just the direction, which is the, uh, of the, where the loss decreases, but actually an estimate of the point where the loss is a minimum, because it's affectionately making a parabolic approximation to the uh, to the function whereas the steepest ascent is making a linear approximation to the function 
One thing I remember being quite astonished when I first did optimization, even with half a dozen parameters, that Newton's method never worked. It always diverged. So you always have to use some regularization method to actually <coughs> make Newton's method work. But with regularization, it did work. And uh, there are variants of these problems, which um, uh, which, for, which uh, the, where you effectively have to look at multiple functions. These either could be constraints, like certain parameters must be positive, or there are also multi, um, you might want to do optimizations where more than one loss function is involved. Uh, you might want to uh, calculate the, um, somehow mod, 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 look at say the time it takes to do a, do a problem and the amount of power it uses and to optimize some combination thereof. And uh, there are no terribly great ways of doing that, but uh, you, you have to be able to cope with that problem. And there's some relatively obvious ways of uh, setting up problems to do that, to do um, multi-objective function optimization or constrained optimization. You typically just add in penalty, you still go back to one loss function where you put in penalty functions. So if you want, if you have a constraint that X is greater than naught, uh, you take your optimization function <coughs> and then you, you add a penalty which pen penalizes X being less than zero. Um, Sorry, I got a bit hoarse. Okay, let's move on. Well, I've already sort of said that. And I've also pointed out that, at well, least in nature, energy functions are always bounded below. And if you use things like the mean square error in um, deep learning, that's always bounded below. And so those are, those usually are the, optimizations you um, try to do. So here is the classic, this is actually effectively called chi-squared. You have an energy, which is the observed value minus, you have a model, which could be a linear model, but it's uh, that the, the thing you're observing is a linear function of what you're trying to, trying to find. And then you take the model expectation and square it. That's what's called, that's linear regression, where uh, <clears throat> I is the, uh, some sort of um, pr parameter defining the data, data, data point, and A and B are the numbers you're trying to uh, determine. And um, in the case of deep learning, we have much more, so the difference between say regression and deep learning is deep learning is a far more sophisticated model. Um, Well, this just proves that the steepest descent is a sensible thing to do. If we have a function and we want to try to decrease, then if you look at the derivative of that function and expand it in a Taylor series, you have the, the shift and you go X goes to X plus the change. Then the, the new value of E is E plus the, um, sum over the derivatives, the derivative vector multiplied into the shift vector. And if the shift vector is a minus sign times the derivative vector, you end up this, um, some sort of whatever the learning rate is, constant times the square of the uh, derivative. And so this says that uh, by Taylor th Taylor's first expansion to first order, that the E is bound to go down. It has to, unless the end, unless the derivatives are zero, when E is unchanged. And of course, if it's small, then if, if uh, DE dx is small, the reduction will be small. Um, now, this is not gonna be true if you, this is the learning rate in deep learning parlance. If that learning rate is too big, 
then this this will go past it will um this particular change will go past the the, the region where the linear approximation is true and um this is an incorrect prediction and you will diverge. And if any of you run TensorFlow, you can easily get divergences uh, in many models. And the only, so in the case of TensorFlow, when you're diverging, you either do one or two things, change the learning rate to a smaller value, or you can just rerun it because next time you run it, it will choose a different random number and it may not diverge. So, both methods are pretty reasonable. I typically do the second by I, when, uh, when my deep learning network uh, diverges, I send it back to the last, uh, the lowest, the, the, the set of parameters which had the lowest um, loss function and just started the game with, with the inevitably different random numbers. Oh, and these are called, you know mathematically what this means. It will diverge if for a case where the first derivative, where the second derivative is large, because the, when you do a Taylor th uh, theorem, you, um, uh, you do the original that energy, the energy a term, which is in the, in the first derivative and the term and the second derivative. I told you that um, we can um, use the second derivative to, to Newton's method, and that gives us an estimate of the actual, um, it doesn't just decrease the loss function, it gives you an estimate of the actual lowest value, the parameters which are best. But the trouble about that estimate is that that is an estimate only true if the third derivatives and higher run are small. And what this thing I learned for the, uh, for when I started optimization was always the higher derivatives are large, at least in all realistic, at least in the nearly all the problems I was looking at. And it always diverged if you just did that simple approximation. But Taylor series expansion is the origin of all these estimates. So that's sort of, um, <clears throat> Now the most serious problem about the Taylor theorem is you can't, Taylor series is you can't use the second order estimate for deep learning because deep learning has too many parameters. So, um, so that's, uh, so the first order methods are practical because the size of the derivative matrix is equal to the size of the matrix of unknowns. And so that doesn't increase the computer time significantly. Whereas the size of the second derivative matrix is the square of the size of the number of unknowns. And if you have a, mil a billion unknowns, that ain't gonna work. It will work up to, um, I don't know, a million unknowns, okay. But that's it. Well, I've shown you, I think these pictures already, these are, to show this is all, this picture came from my talk in 1992 at uh, at uh, optimization conference in Houston, and it showed sort of an in some interest. You have to decide what your loss function. Here, these are meant to be pictures of the energy, and here I just grabbed some. There are several examples here. Here is what you like: a beautiful convex function <coughs> with similar a similar shape in all dimensions. This will converge Im immediately to the right answer. Um, here are some other examples of which are much worse. This is, this is a classic physics energy function. They always look like this. You have this global minima, but it is not smooth. This is not smooth. It's got glitches in it, which are local minima. So if you get here, Unless you try hard, you will not get any further because just here or here are a local minima. And um, that's, um, this is a, so this is a case where the local minima are near the global minimum. My impression is that in many problems that is true. Here is a more exotic problem, which is you might, which at least is challenged by various computer science endeavors, where you have minima, but the minima are completely disconnected. 
And uh, if you're here, you'll never see here because you've got to go right the way up to here and come down. Or, or you won't even see here either. So a, a set of separated minima is, is the hardest problem to do. Because you, unless you explore the entire space, you'll never know if, well, if there's a small deep minima. This is an example here of that general type is smooth but it's got a lot of, um, we can only see a, a couple of the minima. It has lots of minima. And uh, if you get into problems with that type of uh, loss function, you, um, it's not so easy to get out of the, to find the true local minima, except by running lots of choices. Like in the case of um, deep learning, you often run multiple different solutions with which, as everything is random, they have different random starting positions and they therefore can converge to different answers. Here is, a, I found a, one of my medium.com articles had pictures of loss functions, which are shown here. Um, here's a link, you can see a better example thereof. Here is some even more and more interesting structure about the different shapes of the of the uh, of the loss from so I, I, you know when I talk about loss I usually just talk I mean, I've already done that I'm sure in these lectures I talk about uh, mountain ranges because the the strategies used to navigate loss functions are the billion the dimension uh, billion dimension analog of two dimensional mountain ranges well mountain ranges are three but one is the the height of the mountain is the loss and X and Y, the two dimensions of the parameters. Um, so you can, these are here examples of, um, of such uh, these mountain ranges. And um, the claim is that high dimension can actually lead to some advantages. I'm, I'm not certain that's uh, totally obvious. Anyway, this particular article here has uh, some very, lots of very pretty pictures of different loss functions. And typically you can't visualize the loss because it's high dimension. And given your eye structure of your eyes, you can really only see two dimensional losses, but two parameter, one height parameter loss, loss distributions. And um, so it's not usually useful to visualize the loss to find out if it's a local minima. Even though if you could visualize it, you would know immediately whether it was a local minima. So here is a little more detail on this um, loss function. Um, here is, I gave, this is a bit like the physics example I gave. We have a giant uh, trough and we have a uh, halfway down the trough, we have a, a um, local minima. And uh, if you're sitting here, you are need to get to here. And it's the height of this intermediate peak determines whether you can do that easily. If the height is small, you can, it will only requires small shifts from the, um, which you can probably do by just restarting the system, restarting to using a different random numbers at this point here uh, to get over it. And you can see greedy algorithms are very likely to find local minimum because if you're up here and you travel down to the minimum, you're bound to get to here. So you're bound to get into a local minimum. <clears throat> so that's a weakness of, of greedy algorithms. Stochastic gradient descent, and it does reduce this because it's using stochastically, it's, it's putting significant variation into the shifts. Because you're taking random samples of the data to do the, you're not doing, taking the whole data and doing the shift down here, which might give you a long, a large valid shift distance. You're taking, you divide the data into a thousand parts and do a thousandth a small shift of a thousandth that length. And the hope, the, and I think the experience is that that is more reliable. 
Um, well, I say this is well known from uh, people from a long time ago, because um, and it's uh, it's exhibited in this in this physics um, uh, term called annealing <coughs> or tempering, which is a variant thereof. Namely, if you um, take a system and you have it at high temperature, if you pour water on it and cool it to low temperature fast, it will often be, it will often um, have defects in it. And then that the people don't like those defects because they found out that that made the metal which was trying to, um, trying to, to uh, uh, make weak because so if they, if you if you if you're in a not if you, your physics uh, system is not in the local minima and in the true global minima those um mismatches of, of incorrect uh, arrangements of atoms lead to weaknesses and uh, annealing is a simple idea that you only change the temperature slowly and allow the atoms to move around give them time to move around and find the uh, um, the true minimum. And here is a blacksmith trying showing it in real life. And here is a picture showing again. Here we have these physics type um, energy functions. This is at a low temperature, a medium temperature, and a high temperature. And um, what does temperature do? Well, temperature smooths things out. And the highest possible temperature, you do not get these jagged curves. You get a totally smooth curve. And so the idea behind annealing is you start off with a high temperature, you get to here. You then, uh, then you, when you go to a lower temperature, you're not up here, you're actually down here when you get to there and so on. So by gradually reducing the temperature, you, you always operate your system in a place where the parameters are essentially near the minimum. So that's just the physics, that's the way nature does, um, um, does this. And in fact, if you think about quantum computing, there are some, you can do annealing very well with quantum computers. The, this uh, commercial company D-Wave has a quantum computer that does annealing very well because nature does annealing extremely well. And it's being a, it has been claimed to be good for deep learning. Um, <clears throat> all right, so as I said, I think I've already pointed out, there's a real, so there's a significant difference between models today and models in the past. Because today the models are abstract. When you're do doing a, um, when you're designing um, recognition for uh, your self-driving car, you do not make models of cars. Uh, you might uh, use some features of cars to recognize them, but that's it. Whereas when I was doing this type of work uh, many years ago, um, we made the models, the models came from physics. We were looking at some physics data we had a rough idea was what's going on and we made a model which we thought had some hope of explaining this data. And um, so in, in, in our case, the model had parameters, the parameters had physical significance and we, we did optimization to find the best parameters which have made our model fit the data. And I think I have some examples here. All right. The person who actually first taught me how to do modeling was Richard Feynman, who won a Nobel Prize. He's possibly the most brilliant physicist there was. Um, and we wrote some papers together in the 70s, which used making models for a certain type of um, uh, theory, quantum chromodynamics. And we used those models to try to understand how the this quantum chromodynamics described the data and we ended up with pictures like this, which were some measurements of data and some curves describing how various models um, uh, describe that curve. And they were all done by optimization. 
And uh, actually, I did always did the optimization for Feynman in those days. And we, um, and he always taught me this interesting thing that when you have a model, you don't change it. That's not what happens with deep learning. You always are changing the model. But when the model came from physics, he said, don't change it. You derive a model, then you use it, maybe for six months. You then see how it's done over those six months, and then you change it. Because if you, if you keep on changing the model every millisecond or every day, it will always do well, but then you don't quite know what you've done because you keep changing it when a new observation comes along. And here are similar examples of models I made uh, in um, with my, my colleague Rick Field, who, who uh, was uh, who I worked with with Feynman at Caltech. And these are just various experiments we did in those days. All right, here is another, I told you, Stephen Wolfram was a student with me at uh, Caltech. And here we have, uh, here I took a paper from Stephen Wolfram's website, which we worked on together, which is called a model for parton Shars. And so there we, well, we derive models for what happened to these elementary particles decayed. We couldn't observe them, but we took the results of the models and fitted it to data. And that's what a model was in those days. But it's, it is so related to, uh, to what we do today in that um, the model is the hidden variables of, 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 of deep learning. But we thought we had an idea what those hidden variables looked like. And we derived a model which um, built in some features of those hidden variables. In deep learning, you have well, the only assumptions you make about the hidden variables is what you build into is the structure of the network. And so deep learning is in some sense more powerful. In fact, we can redo all this work we did in those days. And it may still be, that may have been redone by people who look at these types of things today, because they still look at these types of physics and do use these model, um, uh, model predictions. So deep learning is a, just a much, a different approach which allows you more flexible models. Um, now we come back to optimization. So if we look at optimization, we have various methods, various problems. One we do is um, looking at uh, radar data to try to, dis to radar data to try to look at snow. If you look at snow, you see layers because you have a season's worth of snow, it freezes, there's a hard top to the snow, the next snow falls on top of it. And so you get a whole set of layers, one layer per year, and you need to analyze how much snow falls in each year. So that's, you have to identify the layers from the radar reflections. Clustering is uh, finding the positions of clusters to minimize um, the some of the squares of the particle position minus the center position. Dimension reduction, which is assigning typically Euclidean positions to particles or entities, so not to particles. You take any odd entity to find in an abstract space, you want to map that space into a low dimensional Euclidean space so you could look at the structure. Another optimization is to find web, which is done every time you do a search, you find the web pages of the nearest. Recommender systems we already discussed. Find the movies, books, what have you uh, near that you want. Actually, it's interesting, like the US Sensing, the Census Bureau uses recommender systems to fill in the blanks. You fill in the census form, but leave out some fields. Well, you can see from your census form you, you can carry, can characterize you, and then it can go and look at other census forms which have similar values for the things you entered, and then try to uh, identify missing parameters. Um, well, uh, face recognition is a good example. Image processing has lots of optimization problems, including recognizing faces and fingerprints and things like that. And as we'll see a little later on, distances are often very important here. Uh, now, 
We have, uh, when we look at loss functions, we have to continue do the continuous versus discrete. We mentioned that. Then loss functions have particular forms. The most famous for me is chi-squared, the sum of squares. Uh, observation minus model all squared, summed over all observations. There is a hidden markup model, which you could view as a early version of a, of a neural net, which just has a few hidden variables uh, for corresponding to the observations. And uh, that's, um, and then you have a markup random field, which generalizes that, but it's still not as general as a as a deep learning loss function, which has lots and lots of la many layers of hidden layers and many and very complex connections. And in physics, we have free energies. That's the energy including the entropy term, which is the kinetic term. And I pointed out how those get smoothed as you go up in temperature. I've already pointed out the greedy algorithms actually should not be dismissed. You should now realize they're greedy, um, and uh, that has consequences. They're not exploring the space as fully as you might. Uh, you typically do greedy algorithms and iterations, and uh, at each step you make the iteration that goes down as much as possible. If you think about a hill, there are some, there are, you can move down the hill in many directions, but there's one direction that goes down the fastest. And in uh, stochastic gradient descent, you have a set of small steps which go down the fastest. And if you go down your hill, you can choose how many steps you take. Now, if you're a person, you take a step, then another step, and then you see what happens. Uh, if you're a computer program, that test take, takes too much time. You just take a step. Because you're taking lots of steps and lots of variables, there's not time to second guess them. With a single human going at a slightly slower speed, that's practical. Notice that Wall Street is full of local local minima. Politics is certainly full of local minima. Um, when somebody from a particular party gets in, so uh, they're often um, actually globally optimized, but in certain criteria, like a certain class of people or a certain set of criteria get used. You change the criteria, they're no longer obviously a minima. Well, I should say optimal. Um, well, recommender engines are a particularly good case of, um, of trying to discuss distances. Uh, if you do what's called collaborative filtering, which is the way you the, the, the technique for deciding how to um, uh, pr predict what uh, people should look at, then this, the, one of the formulations, which is called user-based collaborative filtering, then you, uh, you, you you have a set of users and a set of items, and we're trying to match the users to the items. So you think of the users as a point in the space of items. So there's a space, if you have a billion items, there's a billion dimension space, and then the user rates items. So he has points in his vector, which are the weights, which means he has a lot of missing points in his vector. So this is not a traditional space. Traditional spaces do not have missing points. Because remember, zero does not mean missing. Zero means terrible. So when you rate, so the having so these are interesting vectors which only have some of their components defined. And then there's something called the Pearson coefficient that takes these funny vectors and finds out effectively how near each other. And this type of idea is used continuously by, uh, here it says last.fm, but Amazon and Netflix essentially use these ideas. Um, okay, so we can also do the opposite, which is item-based collaborative filtering. We can think of the items in the space of users. So a given item is, say, rated by a a thousand users, so his, its vector would have a thousand entries, which are the ratings for those users. And so here we have a user space vector for each item. And again, we can find, uh, here it's called the cosine measure for historical reasons, which is a traditional distance measure, effectively, which tells you how, these are, how far these items are apart. Because again, you would expect if a user is looking at a, if a, if a 
viewer watches a movie, and that movie has one of these vectors, then um, if you calculate the distance correctly, so only use the <coughs> the points in common where they're both defined with common ratings, then uh, uh, points in the space which, are, which have similar uh, are similar ratings, which uh, which is what the cosine measured uh, abstracts, are likely to be useful to view. All right. The last uh, slide on distances in funny spaces does the other uh, method for recommender systems, which are content-based recommender systems. Now we have a property space, which might be uh, color, um, a size, um, age, in, uh, age of interest, and things like that. Then you can represent each item in a space of properties. Or it's a space of content, and then then you are trying to find similar items, and so that's um, items that are near each other in this space, and um, that's again used by Amazon, Netflix, and uh, Pandora invented this effect under the name from fancier name the Music Genome. I think it was the foundation of their busy business. Um, well, do we need real spaces? Well, AI involves points. We have events when we're looking at physics and trying to find the Higgs. We have users or items when we're doing recommender engines. We have uh, words and books and documents. And um, you can think of all these thing, things we're looking at as points. They're in some space, which is sometimes called a bag. and then we want to look at, say, the set of all documents, uh, which might be characterized by the um, occurrence of words. So the, um, they could be defined in the space of words. And, um, and um, we then need to see if they're similar, and we need to find a distance between them. And uh, this distance, we'd certainly like it always to be positive. We'd like it to be symmetric, but there is this fancy Euclidean property of Euclidean spaces, that uh, DAB plus DBC is greater than DAC. That's the so-called triangle inequality is not true. So these fake spaces do not have the triangle inequality. And that is actually not a big deal as far as I know. It's just a, it's a property of Euclidean spaces, which probably leads to lots of useful features, but it is not essential. All right, uh, most, for instance, uh, deep learning is what I call here continuous optimization. Namely, it's a, um, you have a function, that function is a functional variable, uh, it depends on variables, those variables can, are continuous. Um, and then we will next go on to discrete. But uh, when you have continuous, then you get these uh, plots like this. And here we actually somehow have sketched on here the path to the minima. So here is a path to the minima. And here is a rather clearer path to here. And you can see how it's done by a set of little sets, little uh, steps which actually go in the local uh, direction of steepest descent. So steepest descent, um, you can't do a steepest descent to the um, to the true minimum here, um, from here, because the steepest descent direction is in this direction. So what you do is you do a whole, you just do an iteratively a set of steepest descents. Each time you go in the steepest descent direction, and uh, say if you don't get trapped in the local minima, you will actually make it. And in the case of um, Deep learning, we actually do lots and lots of these uh, steps, huge numbers. And each time we do it uh, sort of statistically in the right, in the right property, because we just use a sample of the data. And by we do that partly to speed it up, but also uh, this gives us lots of little steps. And by having lots of little steps, we have a much better chance of getting over these uh, getting through these fake minima 
and uh, roaring off to um, the real minimum. Notice actually in physics, it uses a different way of doing statistics. It uses the statistics of smoothing the function, which is the potential energy, uh, with the thing I usually want to minimize is essentially the potential energy of the physics problem, with the, with the kinetic energy terms, which uh, which uh, have typical energy, as I mentioned, kT or kT over two, and um, those are those are used to smooth out the problems. And so each of, all of these methods actually use statistics in some sense to get the right answer. And we have we have um, algorithms which are these the ones here. These last three are the ones I used to use before I did deep learning. They're the classic uh, ways of solving. Uh, nonlinear optimization problems, and they're still probably valuable. I'm not quite certain when they work and deep learning doesn't work, but deep learning can do some of the cases I used to do here. Um, and these tend to use, uh, they can use either first derivative, they can use function evaluation. Most of these use second order methods, smack off explicitly. And levenberg bequart is also second order. And uh, so these are basically second order methods. And for the problems we used to do in those days, they were not so big that you couldn't use second order methods and calculate a, a second order, a second order um, differential for the loss function. Um, if we look at um, discrete optimization, then actually deep learning is good at discrete optimization. It learns, uh, so for instance, whether um, a particular picture is a picture of the letter Z, letter A, B, C, D, E through Z. So that's a, disc, a discrete um, optimization, because we're just trying to find uh, a discrete value, namely uh, one of 26 possibilities for each of the uh, pictures we have. Genetic algorithms are perhaps more um, I mean, important, although they're not as powerful and revolutionary as deep learning. And they sort of use the principle which is done by evolution. So convolutional neural nets actually use the method the brain does. So it's equivalent to a neural net in the brain. Genetic algorithms are, are basically evolution. So they have a, a set of, if you have a function you want to minimize by genetic algorithm, you form a bunch of function values, and that's your population. And then you're going to try to take that population and use the survival of the fittest method. Um, and you are, and you often tend to use this with discrete problems because it's much more natural with discrete problems, though it's not essential. So you have um, a set of points; they're the possible solutions. You have their fitness, which is the value of the objective function or loss function. And then you change the population. You delete things according to rules. You keep things according to rules, and then you mutate them, which you can do by, like in the way nature does, by you know, cosmic rays wiping out a genome or something. I mean, a DNA uh, unit or crossover, which is equivalent to, to, to marriage. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, giving birth, where um, mating rather where um, you take two vectors and then you merge them together and take, say, the part of this part of one vector and this part of the other vector. And you take this, so uh, you take a large population and you iterate this population, and at the end you take the best value. And when you do deleting, you're not going to be deleting the ones that are doing well. This method only uses function evaluation. There's no derivatives being needed. And so it actually can run a lot faster than some of the other algorithms. Uh, finally, we'll talk about heuristics. Here is Wikipedia's definition of heuristics, which are these ad hoc algorithms which you do, which are kind of, which are application dependent, and they uh, are not exact, and they they sacrifice something, and then usually the exactness in order to get a method which can be uh, run reasonably fast and gets reasonably good answers, um, because. Actually, when you think about data, data is not precise. So you don't actually need the exact optimal for most sets of data. You just need a good optimal. 
And that's what heuristics are aimed at. They are aimed at good answers, not exact answers. And there's this concept of computer science called MP hardness, which essentially says it's an exponentially hard problem. But if we actually compare the property of MP hardness with, the, with how hard it is to solve, the many MP hard problems are actually pretty easy to have a good heuristic. And um, so heuristics are very, very important. And I would actually consider the the constraints of being being or not being MP hard are not as important as you might have thought. Thank you. So that's the end of this lesson, and uh, let's get on with the next lesson. <laughs>